Philadelphia that runs five federally qualified health centers. Two are attached to public housing units. One of them is the one where Donna works. One of the health center treats hep C, HIV, and co-infected patients, which is where Katie and Alvin work. And all five are NNCC members. NNCC, National Nursing Centers Consortium, Consortium, which is the grantee for the project, is a PHMC affiliate that advocates for nurse-managed health centers and runs direct services programs in the health centers. So the rationale for the CDC putting out this grant was to promote a program that would implement their new screening project, uh, protocol, which came out last year that targeted baby boomers born between 1945 and 1965, which they think have um, about 75% of the prevalence of hep C around in the country. Also, hep C related deaths now outnumber HIV related deaths and 3.2 million people they presume have H hep C and are not aware of it. Also, 75 to 85% of the people that are infected with hep C will go on to contract chronic hep C. I'm Donna Bryan, I'm the clinical director at PHMC Health Connection. So the um, high-risk populations that the CDC was most concerned about, as Caitlin said, uh, was an age group born between 1945 and 1965, but also people who had um, other risk factors. The most significant other risk factor was injection drug use. Um, whether they were currently, particularly if it was current, but also if the, it had been in the past. Um, people who had gotten tattoos in places other than uh, shops where they, we knew that they would be getting um, clean needles. So people who were, had tattoos done at tattoo parties or in prison um, would be at increased risk. And you can look at the rest of the list. These are all things that uh, would increase the risk of somebody getting hepatitis C. Um, homelessness was, we thought, why would homelessness increase the risk of somebody getting hep C? And it isn't actually the sleeping on a grate or sleeping on somebody's couch, but some of the other behaviors that end up causing people to be homeless, which is which can be drug use or some other uh, issues, is, is the reason that that group is at increased risk. So, so the purpose of the grant was to routinize hep C testing into using an integrated lab-based model with EMR modifications to prompt and track testing in the five FQHCs. That's really just a way of saying we tried to fold it in to what the providers were doing and what the clinic flow was to make sure that when somebody came in that needed to be tested, it was just like ordering regular blood work. So, okay, we're gonna check your blood pressure, your cholesterol, and your hep C status. Um, the ultimate goal was to diagnose new confirmed cases of hepatitis and link those patients to care where, when needed. The timeline was from the end of September 2012 to this coming up, 2013, um, and the, in that time we had to do 2,000 tests. So it was a, seemed to be a pretty straightforward protocol that we would do um, hep C antibody testing on pe patients we had determined to be at high risk. And um, for those that came back positive, we would then do confirmatory testing. And if that came up positive, we would then link them to um, specialists for treatment. So um, we would document, the plan was that we would document the risk information for all the patients that needed testing, and also document for those who needed testing, in injection drug use and HIV status. For anybody that was positive, we would do post-test counseling and um, also behavioral health referrals, other kinds of screening, and give them um, hepatitis A and hepatitis B vaccines. Initially, we were doing post-test counseling on all patients who got the test, whether they came back positive or negative, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So, oh, I'm sorry. 
So there are three main phases to this project. There's the development phase where you figure out what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. The implementation where phase where you do what you say you're going to do and the maintenance to figure out how you're going to continue what you started. So we're going to go and say what we did for all of those. So the development phase. The main thing, again, is to figure out what you're going to do. The thing that we wanted to keep in mind is we wanted to enable anybody that needed and should be screened for hepatitis, they were screened and they were linked to care as needed, regardless of insurance status. And the first thing we did was we met with a steering committee and it, it was a lot of different parties, but it was people from NNCC, all five um, clinical directors, and we sat down and figured out what do we need to do. And we came up with a standard of care. And then I went to each of the health centers and worked with the clinics individually to see how are we going to get this into the patient in the in the clinic flow. So we talked with the all of the providers, the medical assistants, the behavioral health consultants to really figure out. So everybody had a stake in what was happening, and everybody's voice was heard. Um, then we okay. Um, and then the other thing that we did was, it's important to keep in mind that a project like this really does affect everybody involved with the health center. So patients that came back positive that were previously uninsured are now insurable um, if they meet the financial requirements, which ours, our patients do. But now social workers are going to see a big increase in the number of people they're going to have to insure. Um, behavioral health consultants now had to do more behavioral health screenings and substance abuse screenings on patients that came back positive. And billers needed to learn about the, the codes for the rapid hep C test and a new uh, reflex test from Quest. The other thing that we did is we, we had two main contracts. One was with the consultant that we used early on and the other one was with a lab that we chose based on um, like for to use for the uninsured patients. I think it was once you get these labs to see the vision of what you're doing and they sort of see the value of what you're doing, it allows you to negotiate really great prices for these expensive tests. And when it, you're paying for it, that makes a big deal. Um, the other thing is if we, er, we early on we started to work in a coalition building and building partnerships with the community. Philadelphia has a really robust hepatitis support network. We have an advocacy group. Um, the city just got a grant to do hep C uh, surveillance. So it's really reaching out to everybody that's involved because everybody cares. Everyone's pushing for, for improving this health problem in the city. So, so the first thing we had to do was train everybody so that we had, um, we needed everybody to understand the need and also to get a buy-in because it did affect the time that we spent with patients. We had to um, figure out who would be doing what, when it would fit into the clinic visit, um, how we would decide whether we would use a, an oral, uh, rather a rapid test or, a, or send a, a test to the lab. So um, we had to do a lot of training and um, we also had to learn how to do the rapid test, so which wasn't a big deal, but you know everything takes time, and you have to make sure all the right people know how to do things. Um, the RN training also involved explaining to patients what the follow-up, what the next steps would be if they turned out to be positive. So um, they had specific training. We were. In a clinical setting, it's always easier if you can do a rapid test because it's right on the spot. It's done in a few minutes and you can give the patient results immediately. So that was our preference, but it turned out that they were a lot more expensive than the lab tests that Caitlin was able to um, get for, arrange for us with the two labs that we use. Um, and also, of course, a rapid test, if it comes up positive, you still need to do a blood confirmatory test. So um, in deciding how to integrate the patient into the uh, testing into our patient flow, we started with a plan and then it didn't turn out to work everywhere the same way because each clinic has its own personality. So um, initially we had thought that the medical assistants would be the ones to screen the patients for the risk factors and then do get the, collect the specimen. Um, and that worked in some health centers, didn't work so well in other health centers where it ended up being initiated by clinicians instead. And 
the it had we had to figure out which lab to use for um, uninsured patients. So one of them was able to give us a good price, but one of them could do a reflex test for the confirmatory test. The other one couldn't. Ultimately, uh, Caitlin actually got the second lab to do a, a reflex test as well. So that was a real, a real boon for being able to do the testing. So the EMR. Um, I personally think that the EMR has really been the keystone of this entire program. The first thing we did off the bat, and really what it is, is we made it work for us. The first thing that we did was in, implement automatic prompts that would just flag everybody that came in that met the birth year cohort. So if someone like my mom came in and she was meets the age requirement and you pulled up her chart, it would say screen patient, they meet based on birth year cohort. It's really straightforward. Um, the second thing that we did is we created templates and this made it so that providers and MAs could just click things that they needed, that I needed for reporting purposes to the CDC, but the other, and it allowed, but the other thing that it allowed me to do was because it's not free text, we can generate reports. So I can interact with the providers remotely and sort of say, hey, this patient needs this test, don't forget about this test. Um, and it also, the EMRs also allowed us to the, the medical assistants to communicate with the providers. If somebody does a rapid test and it comes back positive, the, the providers can write reminders to themselves saying don't forget to get the viral load in the event of a positive test. So it's really been like very beneficial to us, I, th I think. So implementation. So what we actually did. Um, I think it's really important to keep in mind that this is not taking place in a vacuum, and all of the health centers have countless other things going on in addition to just having to treat patients. Um, for example, they just went through JCO training for Joint Commission. So what we did is we staggered the start dates for all five health centers. In January, the city health department donated 400 rapid tests for us to use by the end of the month. But not all, it wasn't reasonable to think that all of the health centers could do the training in December to actually use them. Um, the other thing is we, we developed a protocol specifically for the MAs. The brunt of the work in the, initially really fell on them. They had to collect the data. They had to collect the risk factors. They had to ask the screening questions. They had to do two separate lab requisitions in some events if the if patient was uninsured and getting other lab work. So we really wanted to work with them to make sure that it, that it didn't interrupt their, their workflow. Um, also during this time, Quest developed five separate, a separate interface for each of the health centers and a separate account so that the lab work for uninsured patients didn't get sent to the, the individual health centers. They came directly to me and then I could pay that bill. Um, the original protocol for the uninsured patients to keep the cost down because the labs were, the confirmatory labs were so expensive were to perform the antibody test. In the event that it came back positive, bring the patient back in start the insurance process, and then once they were insured, perform the confirmatory test. This was a lot and took a lot of time and it, it was un, unreasonable. So after we implemented all of this, this pretty much sums up the general feeling at the end where everyone was just completely overwhelmed and we, we had some issues that we had to fix. So, <laughs> so the best laid plans never go the way you quite expect them to. And overall, it was, it worked well, but we had, to, we did have to fix some things. So we, um, some of the health centers, um, like our health center continued to screen based on um, the risk factors. Others, there are two health centers among the five who treat uh, homeless patients. And because homelessness is one of the risk factors, rather than um, questioning them for the other risk factors and trying to figure out if they were eligible, that sort of took care of it and they basically screened everybody. So um, that cut down on the decisions of who to screen, who not to screen. At our health center, our medical assistant 
continues to do the screening and collect the specimens. Um, at the very beginning, because we were using the rapid tests, she, she would also put in documentation for us um, that the test had been done and results given. The clinician then would review the results with the patient. Um, and then when they changed the rules that we didn't have to let everybody know, it, that made it a lot easier because we were by then using a blood test. And so when we had to let everybody know, we had to make many, many calls. And you can't always reach patients. And as all of you know, it's, it's not easy to um, get in touch with everybody. So the, um, we were able to change, when they changed the uh, protocol so that we only had to let people who had positive hep C screens know what their results were. And um, that really helped with the, with the flow. Um, now, whenever we do a blood test, it has a, uh, a reflex to do the confirmatory test if it's positive. So that saves bringing the patient back in for a second blood draw. And it also means that we, if we have difficulty getting in touch with them, we have both tests done and we can, um, we go from there. We don't, we're not getting them back time and time again just to get the rest of the testing done. So one of the things that Caitlin was able to do is work with our IT department to decrease the number of clicks to make it easier to do the documentation. Um, and I already talked about that the post-test counseling didn't have to now be done for every test. It only had to be done for the positives or if somebody was an intravenous drug user in the last 12 months. Um, our nurse managers as well as our nurse practitioners are referring patients uh, for the follow-up care. And the, um, the pr Caitlin is able to go into the EMR and see where there are things that still need to be done. So if uh, a patient hasn't gotten back for the confirmatory test or a patient has gotten their confirmatory test but hasn't come back in for follow-up so that we can um, work on referring them into care, uh, Caitlin can let the clinicians know. So it's, it's been a great help to have a project coordinator to, to oversee the whole thing and um, help, help move things along for us. So now, just hold it. Um, so now we're currently in phase three of the project and it's, it's how to make sure that this is sustainable. We're going to obviously continue to troubleshoot and figure out, make sure like what's preventing people from getting tested, it should be tested, and making sure that people are linked to the care that they need. But also we're going to look into seeing how, if it's reasonable to replicate this type of a, a model in other health centers. Um, this is definitely proven to be a model that's interchangeable with other types of tests, uh, which we're actually going to explore in another grant, but the other thing that we had to do is figure out how are we going to continue funding and paying for the uninsured lab work. Um, this is a one-year grant, so as of September 3rd, 29th, 2013, the CDC will no longer pay for those lab work, that lab, so we actually have found a grant, a funder, to continue the project for the next year. We're going to add HIV testing to it and also an outreach component for both hepatitis C and HIV, and I think that that's really going to be a huge help in making sure that patients are linked into care and, and stay in care. Um, I would also say it's not on the slide, and I know that not all funders will fund this, but we're also gonna add in incentives because this is a lot of work, and I do think that the people that are, are um, doing the actual boots on the ground work should be rewarded for meeting the benchmarks that they should. So, um, and now we'll get into some data. <laughs> so since the start of the project in October, first 2012 through the end of May we've done 1185 tests this is so I'll get into the difference with what the EMR showed this is just like a, a straight report um, 134 of those tests have come back positive that's a zero positivity of about 11.3 percent of that 134 tests uh, 79 of the patients have had the confirmatory RNA test, and of that 79, 50 have come back with detectable RNA. So we have about a 63% um, 
of a confirmed hep chronic hep C diagnosis. When going through that data, I found that some patients knew they were already positive and they may have been diagnosed in the 80s or while they were incarcerated and that's entered as free text. So I can't pull that from a report. So after going through all 104 of these uh, charts, I found that 83 of them did not know that they had hepatitis C. And that is a 7% zero positivity rate, which is on point exactly with what the CDC suggests, uh, had, had predicted. Of the 83, 46 have had a confirmatory test, and of that, 26 have come back positive, so 56.5% of a newly diagnosed zero uh, chronic hep C, which is really great. So this is the birth, this is our data for the birth year, the whole reason that the, the grant happened in the, to begin with. Um, so of the 134, 99 came back with, as patients who fell within the birth year cohort. That's about a 74% pos uh, zero positivity which is pretty close to the CDC 75% of what they thought that the, the age range was for the people that were positive. Um, then of the patients that came back positive, 52 have had the confirmatory test and 31 have come back with a confirmed chronic hepatitis C diagnosis, that's about 60%. Um, again, going through and seeing which patients knew that they had hep C, 66 of the 99 did not, 37, of those had the confirmatory test in 22, or almost 60% newly diagnosed chronic hep C within the birth year. And now this is a little data for these two health centers. Um, I, they, we picked them because they are the two separate models of the MA versus the provider driven. This is the care clinic. In that time frame, they've done 439 tests. Their high risk come from the age group H patients with the HIV positive status, um, injection drug use, and homelessness. Of the 439 tests, 84, per 84 came back, which is a 19.1% zero positivity rate amongst their patients. It's pretty high. Um, however, going through again, you find that 40, 46 of them are, did not know that they were, had positive hep C. And then of that 46, 27 had the RNA test and 17 new confirmed cases of hep, chronic hep C. Um, if you, the thing that I think I'd really like to point out about this slide is the 10.5% zero positivity. So that is the 46 newly diagnosed patients out of the 439 total tests. That number is huge and it cannot, I cannot emphatically say this is the best data that I can provide to show if you have a high risk population, this is really important to start doing, is, is doing this hep C screening. Um, so now we'll get into the health connection, which is Donna's Health Center. They have a very low risk population. They see pediatric and pediatric to geriatric patient population. They maintained the medical um, assistant driven model. Most of their tests have been done based on um, patients getting, having tattoos from unlicensed shops. So of the 325 tests, they've had 13 come back positive. All 13 are truly new diagnosed patients. 10 have had the confirmatory test and half of those have come back with um, a new confirmed case of chronic hep C. And they have a 4% zero positivity rate, which I think it's not 7% it's not with the CDC thought or the 10.5 at the care clinic, but this is a 4%, which is a, a, a comparable number in a low risk population. So even if you don't think you have patients that have hep C, you would be surprised, so. So just to sort of wrap things up, the things that, um, if you're thinking of doing a hep C screening program, the things that you need to take into account, you need to find a source of money to pay for the uninsured labs. Um, that's, that's been our biggest cost. The other pieces are easier to do, but you need to get some source of funding. Now with healthcare reform and more people being insured, that will be easier, but it probably won't be everybody. Having a point person to oversee the project really made it doable. Because if each of these health centers was 
independently trying to do it with nobody um, having really a significant amount of time to work on this, it would have been really difficult to make it happen. The, um, Caitlin spent a lot of time working with the labs, um, training people, going through the data. This is all stuff that none of us would have had time to do. So having somebody, it doesn't have to be somebody's full-time job, but it does need, you do need somebody with dedicated time to put this into place. If you have an electronic health record, it's important, uh, it, it's important to get it to work for you. So designing templates that um, make it easy to put the data in, get the data out, have it be accurate, being able to track uh, lab results is really um, makes this a doable project as well. And then figuring out how to fit it into the clinic flow. So at the beginning, Everybody was overwhelmed. We're so busy, we're doing this, we're doing that. How are we gonna fit this in? And we only have one medical assistant who preps all of our patients, gets their vital signs, starts the notes, does the lab work for three clinicians. And um, it was a little overwhelming, but she was able, we, we shortened the number of questions. We, we made, uh, made the templates so that she could quickly document it. And, um, we really have to give her credit for making this work in our health center. Um, at the care clinic, it didn't work having the medical assistants kind of spearhead this. So f the uh, model that they're using is that the clinicians um, do the screening and ask for the test to be done, and that's worked for them. So you kind of have to figure out what works in your center to, um, to, to let the screening happen. But when we started the project, and they came to us with the idea for this grant, said, yeah, that's a great idea. We should be screening people, and this way we'll just be paid to do it, and someone will be there to pay for the lab tests. We didn't take into account having to figure out each little step and then some of them not working, and we had to revise our plans. So there was, it was more complicated than we thought when we agreed to do it. But when we started to see what the results were, people who were coming up positive that had no idea they had hep C, um, said this is really worth doing. And we were really glad that we had, um, we had gotten involved. And that's it. So if you guys have any questions for us, that's our contact information. We can answer anything. But if you guys have any questions now, we'd be more than happy to answer them. All right. Oh, yeah. The general population is supposed to be about 7%. So some of, of, of the five health centers that we have done this project in, our seropositivity from, from the preliminary data is, has ranged from 2.8% to 10.5. And what? It says general of the all American population. Um, so, yeah. So, on the average, we're hitting the seven, but it, there's actually a range. Yeah. Yeah. You want to talk to that, Ellie? It's not that they couldn't handle the initial setup, it was more that it wasn't efficient. So it, it made, so what we did at two of the health centers, one of which is the care clinic, and you guys are more than happy to chime, we said, we assume that their entire patient population qualifies based on one of the screening criteria. And I have, I didn't say it. So this top thing, if you guys can see it, I don't know if you can, those are the screening criteria. And so we assume that all of their patients will qualify. So asking them these questions really, doesn't make sense. Um, and so that's why we, it, it's not that, we didn't wanna like take it away from the MA and not, you know, not think that they're capable of doing it, but it just, it wasn't time efficient. But Alvin and Katie, if you guys wanna. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm the clinical director at the care clinic, but um, just to speak to your question there, uh, it just seemed like it worked better for us to, for the clinicians to um, do the screeners and um, it just was a better flow for us at the clinic to do it in that way, basically. 
at, at one of the other health centers where we did this, Mary Howard, I had spoken with the, the MAs and the providers after this whole thing started. And another thing that was happening was there, um, they were short MAs, and so sometimes the MAs weren't even asking the screening questions because they have a huge patient load and they are doing the vitals for all, I mean, they have like eight providers at once and they were overwhelmed. And then we were also finding that there was miscommunication between the nurse practitioners and the medical assistants also. So both were doing the screening and it was just, made it a lot simpler. <laughs> Anything else? Good afternoon. I'm Katie Wynn, and I'm a physician assistant. And this is my colleague Alvin Kincaid. And we're really happy that you guys stuck around. I know it's not a huge group, and it's the end of the day, but we are really excited to, to share a little bit with you from the clinician standpoint about hepatitis C and what role we have as clinicians in treating it. Is there anything we can do about this? Okay. I think what we'll do today is just see if you guys have any burning questions before we start instead of waiting till the end. Is there anything that you guys want to know about hepatitis C in general at all? One second. Can you mute that? Thanks. Okay, so no questions? Maybe you'll have some by the time we're done, but hopefully you'll be able to stay awake. I know you're tired. Um, it's been a long day. Um, but we're excited to share just a little bit about what we're doing um, at the Care Clinic, which is a PHMC clinic in Philadelphia. Um, Alvin and I are both physician assistants, and we treat hepatitis C. We also treat hepatitis C in the co-infected population, and the co-infected defines a patient having HIV and hepatitis C. And so a lot of times people are at risk for one, they get the other, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But we treat hepatitis C mono-infected, we treat HIV, and we treat co-infection at our clinic in Philadelphia. So we're targeting clinicians, but any other uh, uh, people that work with those in public housing are more than likely to confront both of these diseases. At one point, hepatitis C and HIV were just referred to a specialist, but now we're finding ourselves at nurse-managed clinics um, as PAs, as mid-levels, being those that are on the front lines of facing both of these diseases. And so it's very important that the community clinician, those that are treating those uh, in public housing, know about hepatitis C as well as HIV and are able to effectively treat these diseases. So just in general, these are the topics that we're going to cover in our presentation. The community clinician's role in hepatitis C is to screen, diagnose, assess for treatment readiness, treat, and or refer, and always our role as community clinicians is to educate and support. So hepatitis C is a new disease. It wasn't named hepatitis C until 1989. Um, before this, it was known as non-A, non-B hepatitis. And as you've already heard, but we'll reiterate again, there are five million people in the United States infected with hepatitis C. This is four times as many as HIV. And we haven't heard, we haven't heard a lot about it like we have HIV. Um, HIV kind of was named and came out in the early 80s, and hepatitis C was in the early 90s, and so just now in 2013, we're starting to get our minds around the, the severity of this, of this disease and what it means um, for the, the health of our population. Um, in 2003, chronic liver disease was a leading cause of death, and hepatitis C is the biggest contributor to these, these deaths. Um, hepatitis C affects the liver slowly over time. And what it does is that it causes the liver to scar, and that scarring is called fibrosis, and that can lead to cirrhosis, which can cause the liver to fail. Um, it also can lead to liver cancer, which can also cause death. So this is the worst of what happens at the end of hepatitis C, but it's a slow process. Um, 
It happens over time, and we have another slide on that in a, in a bit. So our role as clinicians, as Caitlin and Donna already presented, is to screen for hepatitis, first and foremost, to know those that are at risk and to effectively implement a screening tool. Um, this is just a general slide talking about who is at risk. And traditionally, as they mentioned in their presentation, those that have any exposure to blood products, healthcare workers, are those at risk. Um, we kind of know that. A couple uh, of the, the risks listed on here that you might not be as familiar with is um, sexual contact. You can get hepatitis C from sexual contact and vertical transmission when a mother can transmit it to her baby, especially if she doesn't know she has hepatitis C. So these were the old guidelines in 1998, and the new guidelines, as they mentioned, were to test based on a birth cohort, which is those born between 45 and 65. And this is going to help us target those 75% of people that don't know they have hepatitis C. So we already said that 5 million people in the United States have hepatitis C. 75% of those people don't know it. And so this whole movement with hepatitis C in the news, on the radio, and us talking about it is this new wave of understanding that hepatitis C is around a 7% um, rate, and 75% of people might not even know it. And we need to find those people so we can decrease, ultimately, the deaths caused by liver disease. So this is the CDC's health initiative, um, just to remind us that those born from 45 to 65 need to get tested. 75% of people don't know they're infected, and uh, this is their public health announcement to encourage everyone to get tested that's at risk. This is um, a slide from the task force, reminding us that obviously those that are exposed to blood uh, products before they were tested, and those that use IV drugs, but also those in the birth cohort. And as was previously mentioned, there's a rapid test, which is a lot easier than a blood test if you're doing it in the community, but you can also do the blood test if you're doing it in a clinic. Uh, and the, the test in the community is a rapid test, so you don't have, the patient doesn't have to be able to come back to get their results. Um, our second role as a clinician in a clinic is to diagnose. So if someone comes back with a positive antibody, if you're screened in the community, just like HIV, you have to have a second test to confirm it. So if you have a positive antibody test, you need to test for the RNA, as Caitlin mentioned. And then if that is positive, you have chronic hepatitis C. And the numbers they were showing were closer to 40%, but the range is between 15 and 40% of those could have been exposed to hepatitis C but not have gotten the chronic form. Um, if the antibody test is negative and they've had a recent risk factor, or if you think that they're immunocompromised and may not be able to come up with a positive antibody test, you can also do the RNA test at that time. As I mentioned earlier, those with acute hepatitis C, some people can fight the disease on their own and resolve that condition. And I think we're gonna get a clearer number on that with all the testing that's happening. In our clinic, I think it's closer to 35% of people clear it on their own. And the rest of the people develop chronic hepatitis C. And slowly, year by year, the longer you have this chronic hepatitis C, it can lead to fibrosis, cirrhosis, liver cancer, and ultimately uh, death because of liver failure. So that progression is sped up by a few things. Um, one of them is drinking. One of them is di being diagnosed with hepatitis C at an older age. And a big one is HIV co-infection. And we have a lot of people co-infected at our clinic. And so the rate of that, that disease is sped up. Um, this is looking at different populations and the rate of co-infection. Among the IV drug users, the rate is up to 90% have hepatitis C and HIV. Um, and within those that are HIV positive, about a third have hepatitis C. As I said, the progression is sped up with, um, hep with HIV. Oh, excuse me. Absolutely, yep. HIV is not transmitted through sweat, through saliva, through your hands. HIV is, is transmitted through blood and sex fluids. 
not tears, not urine, not anything else you can think of. So only if for some reason there are sex fluids, male and female, and blood are involved. That's how HIV is transmitted. Nope, nope, nope. So, so a person that has both, as we were saying, HIV and hepatitis C, the, the, the liver disease goes much faster, up to three times as fast. And it's even worse in those with low CD4 cells or those that aren't um, doing as well with the HIV. Um, there's a big study among those with HIV and it showed that liver disease, apart from uh, AIDS-related deaths, is the number one reason that people are dying. And that's what we're seeing in our clinic. Alvin and I have been practicing there for 10 years and we've been treating HIV for that long. And HIV is becoming a chronic disease that can be controlled and managed. But people that, our patients that are dying are dying of liver disease. So that's really an initiative and an encouragement to us to start screening people for hepatitis C, diagnosing and treating it earlier so that that progression doesn't happen and they don't have their life shortened by hepatitis C, especially when they've worked so hard to fight their HIV and to do so well at taking their medications. Um, everyone that has HIV should be screened for hepatitis C and all patients should be evaluated for hepatitis C therapy. Um, sometimes specialists especially aren't open to treating HIV patients for their hepatitis C, partly because of maybe fear or not understanding HIV, but also maybe not thinking that these patients are ready for this treatment when they actually really are. A lot of people with HIV understand the importance of medication adherence. They have a good relationship with their clinician and are actually excellent candidates for hepatitis C therapy. So next I'm gonna pass it to my colleague Alvin Kincaid to talk a little bit about assessment. Okay, thank you, Katie. So at this point we're gonna talk about the assessment of the patient that's co-infected with HIV and hepatitis C. So who should be considered for treatment? Now not everyone that has hepatitis C or HIV is a candidate for treatment, but these are the things that we wanna look for. I'm going to look and see if a patient is, has compensated liver disease and see if they're controlled on their HIV medications. Uh, I'm going to look to see if there's any contraindications for treatment because a lot of times with hep C therapy and HIV therapy, there are some drug interactions. So we want to make sure that there in, there's none of that going on and also we want to make sure that the patient with HIV is stable meaning that they aren't having any effects from the HIV medications and we're going to make sure that they're that they have a good uh, viral load level and a good CD4 level before we consider treatment for hepatitis C. So to treat or to wait. Uh, the decision is made as a team. So the patient understand the risk and benefits. Uh, it's between the provider. We also uh, have a mental health specialist that's involved in the care. And uh, we wanna look at the disease stage and see if they were fit for treatment and make sure that there are no contraindications for treatment. This is how we, this is the, what we like to affectionately say. We want to see if our patients are sick, sober, or sane. So in assessing the patient, this is what we're looking for. And this is what's going through our mind, trying to see if our patients are ready for treatment. So uh, step one for our patients, uh, we want to assess the length of the infection. We want to discuss uh, any risk factors like uh, intravenous drug abuse, uh, we also want to look at the history of hep C test and uh, also the hepatitis C uh, RNA. We definitely want to educate. Education is the key here with our patients because we want to empower them. We want to give them a sense of understanding so that if they are going to go on treatment, they have a sense that they can do it and they have a positive outlook on, um, on the treatment. So we want to look at uh, avoiding alcohol consumption. I'm going to discuss some uh, medications that could affect them, like uh, acetaminophen or Tylenol, which could potentially cause liver uh, damage if taken in high doses. We're going to look at some herbal medications that may be beneficial for some people. Uh, we also want to look at uh, different precautions uh, for transmission. Uh, you also want to discuss some you know, weight loss issues, because some patients may be a little overweight. Just as a general sense of health knowledge, we, we want to talk about these things for our patients. So patients should be counseled on how to prevent transmission. So the things that we, we try to educate them on is uh, 
how hepatitis C is spread. So there's blood to blood contact. Uh, there's also a risk for sexual uh, intercourse. That's, a, that's another way. And uh, we definitely want to um, har uh, harp on our patients as far as um, how it's not spread. So it's not spread by sneezing, hugging, coughing, um, sharing food or drinking water or sharing needles or anything of that, that sort. So we definitely want to make patients aware of that. Um, we want to make sure that patients do not donate blood or uh, do anything like that because, you know, that, um, they, they can't do that because of the, the hepatitis C. Uh, stop any illicit drug use and um, we want to ask them not to share any uh, personal items. Uh, toothbrushes, uh, nail grooming equipment, and razors, and things like that. Support groups. Support groups are very important, especially with our co-infected patients, because this is how they gain their, gain their confidence. Uh, patients may be uh, dealing with different things, and if they go and um, have, enter into these support groups, they may be able to get some information that can help them through with their treatment. So support groups are, are very important in care. So the next point is we want to look at the labs. So uh, these are some of the labs that we would take for our patients. And uh, basically, uh, some of these labs are going to check for hepatitis A, hepatitis B. And um, in doing this, uh, we're, we're looking, we're assessing to see if we need to vac vaccinate them for any of these, uh, for the hepatitis A and hepatitis B. Uh, also, that's very important, is the genotype for uh, hepatitis C. We want to look at the genotype because the genotype really can um, drive us as far as how treatment will go for the patient. Of course, we want to look at a complete metabolic panel, um, a CBC. We want to look at the lipids. And you, we, we basically want to do a general screening of everything to make sure that there are no contraindications for, a person, for the person before they go on treatment. So when we review the labs, we want to look at the viral load. And this is very important because if the person's viral load is undetectable, as you see, if it's less than 50, the patient has cleared the virus and there's no need for further testing unless the, there's a recent risk factor. Um, and if that's the case, if it's a recent risk factor, then we would encourage the patient to be tested again in another two to four weeks. Um, if um, the person does have a positive um, RNA test, uh, if they had a viral load, then there's going to have to be more labs that we do for the patient because at that point, the patient uh, does need treatment. So some of the other tests would be an alpha feeder protein, an INR. These are tests to assess the liver's healthiness to see if uh, um, how, how bad or how severe the person's uh, liver disease is. And then there's a special test with technology and stuff. They develop these special tests as a FibroShore or a HEPA-score. Now, these these, this test is very good in staging. Uh, for uh, fibrosis to let us know how much scarring that the liver may have. And as I was saying earlier, genotype tests, and that helps us in the staging as far as um, how, how treatment will go for the patient. So he hepatitis C infection worldwide, and this is the genotype distri uh, distribution. And as you see, in the United States, genotypes 1, 2, and 3 are the major um, genotypes. Uh, what we see mostly are um, genotype 1, especially in African Americans, and that's the, the majority of, of the uh, genotypes that we see, which also happens to be the, one of the most difficult uh, genotypes to treat in patients. So some of the other labs that we may get, we want to rule out any autoimmune hepatitis, uh, Wilson's disease, which is a mitochondrial um, disorder. Uh, we're going to also look uh, to rule out any biliary cirrhosis in our patients, and uh, we'll do labs to rule out any of these disorders. Ultrasound is important, too. So an ultrasound will be done, and that will help us to see if there's any uh, scarring. We're actually trying to rule out if the person has any cancer, uh, if the liver is swollen. So, so with that test, if um, we detect any um, cirrhosis, uh, then we would have the patient do uh, an ultrasound every six months, and we also would do an alpha feeder protein screening um, every six months as well. Biopsy or not the biopsy? At one point, this was the major way of how we would figure out if the person had fibrosis. Now, with all these special tests, the HEPA score or FibroShore uh, tests that I was mentioning earlier, these tests sort of help us into. Uh, figuring out the, 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 the scarring or the fibrosis that someone has. So we don't necessarily have to do biopsies anymore. 
So is the patient, does the patient cirrhotic? Some of the signs of a, of a patient having cirrhosis is that they'll have ascites. So ascites is when the abdomen is distended, meaning it's swollen. And um, they also may have, um, the, the liver may be swollen. They may have a blood level, which shows that their albumin is decreased. The INR may be elevated, and, uh, and as well as the liver functions test. And they may have jaundice, the yellow parts of the eyes being yellow. And they may have asterisks, which is like the flapping of, of the arms. Uh, some symptoms that they may experience are esophageal varices, um, easy bruising, tea-colored urine, and clay-colored stools. Um, another way that uh, we could um, assess the patient, too, if they have cirrhosis, is to see if they're uh, compensated. So what, what happens is if we do the ultrasound, the ultrasound shows that they may have signs of cirrhosis, but at the, the next step is to see if, if, they're, if they have compensated or decompensated uh, liver disease. If they're decompensated, that's a bad thing, and we, we don't like that because uh, that means that's a, a bad sign and they could be uh, having severe liver disease and liver failure. So this uh, child Pew score is a way that we can um, figure that out. So there's different um, lab levels that we will look at. It's bilirubin level, the albumin, uh, prothrombin time, ascites, and encephalopathy. So we would give it a grade, at, uh, one, two, one, two, or three. And through this grade, we can figure out with the child Pew score whether someone has a decompensated or if they're a compensated uh, liver disease. So if it's six or, or over, then we know they're decompensated. And like I said, that's not a good thing. And at that point, I'm probably going to, and Katie, we're probably going to refer to a liver specialist. So what are symptoms of hepatitis C? For the most part, 70% of persons with acute hepatitis C are asymptomatic, meaning they have no symptoms whatsoever. So when symptoms occur, that usually is a sign that they may have advanced disease. So they may have symptoms of uh, loss of appetite, they may have the jaundice, may have nausea, they may have a vomiting, um, dark colored urine, um, and, and, and symptoms like, like those. Um, the ALT is another blood test um, as a trigger for hep C, hepatitis C screening, but uh, that's not a good test to look at to, to see if there's any damage to the liver. 85% um, of the patients um, can be missed um, if, if that test is, is looked, about, looked at. Um, so how sane is our patient? So we want, as I said earlier, we want mental health involved, so we definitely want to see if a person is mentally uh, and emotionally okay. So we want to go over some of the rumors, some of their beliefs that they have, and before they go on treatment, we definitely uh, may want to consider starting them on an SSRI. Sober. So as we were saying, we want to see if they're sick, sane, or sober. So sober, are they still getting high? We want to talk to the patient. We want to go over different things, look at if there's any indicators that, that we may see if they're still, still getting high. We do a urine drug screen. Um, you know, talk to them about uh, some of the things that they, they did in the past and some of the other risks that are there so that we can properly assess to see if they're sober before starting treatment. So at this point, I'm going to pass it back to Katie because we're going to talk about treatment. Great. So you've assessed your patient and you have an idea that you want to try to treat this patient in, in the clinic. And like Alvin said, it's a decision that's made by a whole team of people. Um, and it's, it's an important uh, question to ask. It's a lot of work. Hepatitis C medications are no joke, and I tell people that every day. It's not something that's going to be easy. But just because of that doesn't mean we should avoid it for the provider or for the patient. Um, hopefully in the next five years it will get a lot easier, but right now it's still very hard, difficult treatment, but hepatitis C treatment is a cure. So if you hear nothing else from all this talking that we're doing up here, remember that hepatitis C is a disease that can be cured, unlike HIV and unlike even hepatitis B, which is more just kind of controlled, it, hepatitis C can be cured, and that has to do with the type of virus that it is. So before getting started, you have to be sure, again, that this patient is a good candidate medically. You do some more screening tests. 
You look at the genotype. If they're two or three, they go on uh, dual therapy, two medications, a shot and a pill, interferon and ribavirin. If they're four, they also go on the two, and there's a lower risk, uh, lower uh, chance of curing with type four. But type two or three, um, with these two medications, there's a cure rate, what we call an SVR rate, of 70 to 80 percent. And that, those medications have been around for a while. The new stuff has to do with genotype 1, and as Alvin said, the genotype 1 is the most common type of hepatitis, and it's also the hardest to treat. And uh, two years ago now, there was two new medications that came out to add on to the other two that I mentioned. So now for genotype 1, they call it triple therapy. There's the pegylated interferon, the ribavirin, and one of these protease inhibitors. Uh, and there's a lot higher rates of response with these three medications. Um, so like we said, hepatitis C can be cured and it's defined as a sustained virological response. So six months after finishing these meds, they still can't find the virus in the blood. Historically, this rate, this SVR rate, this cure rate was only around 50 percent for those with genotype 1 and even lower for those with HIV as well that are co-infected. But now rates of cure are around 75 percent, so it's very exciting. Um, and it's important to talk to the patient whether they've been on medications before. If they were on the old stuff, the dual therapy, then they are categorized in types of responders, and that's used to determine how long their new treatment will be for. Both of the, the PIs, the new medications, are response guided. So depending on how the patient does, you will continue the medication, stop it, or continue it for even longer. Um, and there's some what they call futility rules, and so treatment is stopped if the patient is not responding, which is encouraging when you're starting somebody because you can tell them, we'll know at four weeks and at 12 weeks how you're doing, and we can encourage them to keep going, or if it's not working, they don't have to go through the full course, which is usually six months. It can be 12 months depending on the patient. There's a lot of side effects with these medications, as I said. Uh, hepatitis C treatment is no joke, and people can feel pretty bad. They can get anemic, which causes people to feel tired, and they can get rashes, which is, can be very itchy. Um, the interferon, the, the shot that people get, uh, can also cause them to feel like they're pretty sick, like with the flu. Um, but a lot of these, these symptoms can be managed in support. And that's what I feel like we really do a good job of in our clinic. Um, if you go to a specialist clinic, they might not be able to extend uh, care in this kind of way. They might just give the patient the medications and say, see you in a few months. But at our clinic, we have frequent visits with patients. We support them with a lot of ancillary medications, with Tylenol, with stuff for problems with anal itching, uh, witch hazel pads. Um, a and D ointment. We have a whole package of things we give patients. Benadryl, hydrocortisone, even before they have a symptom, we give them all these things. And that really helps the patient succeed. Hepatitis C medications, like HIV medications, are dependent on the patient's compliance, which is a lot of work for both the patient and the provider of actually taking the medication. And that's easier than it can seem, as you guys know, working in community health. So it's really communicating with the patient, getting feedback with frequent visits. And in the beginning, we like to see the patient at least once a week. Um, so these are other guidelines that we use to reduce some of the medications or stop them if needed, if a patient's having significant laboratory results. There's a lot of medications that interact with these, these new medications, and so it's important for the providers to review the medication list. And someone that does have HIV and hepatitis C may have to adjust their HIV meds, but they do stay on the HIV meds during the treatment of the hepatitis C. Um, as I mentioned, in the next five years, there's going to be a lot of new medications for hepatitis C. As we've seen in this presentation, hepatitis C is very popular right now because of this new public health data. There's a lot of screening, a lot of testing, and a lot of hepatitis C. So these patients are going to have to go somewhere and be treated with something. So that's really encouraged a lot of the pharmaceutical companies to start inventing easier, better drugs with higher rates of SVR, higher rates of cure. Um, there's more than 90 drugs that are being developed by more than 15 companies. There's two approaches. One is still using the old stuff, the Pegasus or the pegylated interferon and the ribavirin and adding on one new agent for that triple therapy 
or hopefully getting away from that old stuff that has a lot of side effects and having interferon-free options. We're still likely about three years away from that happening. And this is just a slide to show you some nitty gritty of all the, the agents being developed by many companies. And it's exciting, so maybe in five years, um, the treatment will be one pill once a day for a few months, and then the patient will be cured. So hopefully this is a disease that in our lifetime we will see go from right now, which feels like the bulk of it, to being less of a, less of a problem and less of a public health uh, issue. So that's all we have um, as far as our presentation. Are there any questions? Yes. It's very high. The old stuff was a little expensive, maybe a couple thousand dollars a month, but the new protease inhibitors, I think, are up to $100,000 for the course, which is three months. They're very expensive. But in, in, our, in our state of Pennsylvania, we can get them covered through Medicaid. treatment of it? For the treatment of it? Yeah, at this, at this time we're not really quite sure how that's going to shake out because, um, you know, even with our patients with our, that are HIV positive, um, there's some talk that there, there may be some formularies to help uh, save costs and, and things like that. And um, some of the pharmaceutical companies are talking about giving special pricing. Uh, so. Um, I, I think that that's probably where it, it may go so that if everybody's in care, they're going to be able to afford uh, giving everyone treatment that is um, qualified to be on treatment. Thanks so much for hanging in there with us. Mm -hmm.